from our studios on Florida's Gulf Coast. This is Women of Grace Live. Join us today as we discuss issues important to your life and faith. Spiritual insight, compelling discussion, practical wisdom. Women of Grace for such a time as this. Now, here's your host. Johnette Bankovic. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace Live. I am Johnette Bankovic. What a blessing and privilege it is to be with you today. Have I told you lately how much I enjoy spending this time with you Monday through Friday right here on EWTN Radio, brought to you by your local affiliate? If I haven't, I want to let you know that it is a divine privilege and I embrace every second that we have together, always asking that the Holy Spirit is with us, imbuing those minutes, those seconds with his own sweet presence. We are here today and it is a special day. It's one of those days when we are not going to be taking any phone calls. I know, I know, we take phone calls every day that we're together, except occasionally. And this is one of those days because I have a beautiful beautiful guest with us today who has an absolutely remarkable testimony to share about how it is that she came out of darkness into light, how it is that she found Jesus as a Muslim woman. And I was captivated by her story and captivated when I had the opportunity to meet her not very long ago at an event here in our own Tampa Bay area. And, you know, I've been wanting to bring her story to you. I have. Because I think that there's so much that we can learn through the personal witness. It's one of the best means that we have of evangelizing. When we share our testimony of God's providence in our life, when we share the way in which God has regaled us with his holy presence in our life, when we hear others share their testimonies of how it is that he took circumstances that seemed so bleak, so impossible, and changed them into fire-tried gold that radiates forth with the light that comes from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the merits of his cross, Why, it increases our faith. It builds us up. It helps for us to be edified and to have hope and to have confidence as we face the travails of life and as we grow in relationship with God. And this beautiful lady's testimony is one that I know is going to do all of that for you. Before you have the opportunity to meet her here and before I introduce her to you, I do want to share with you about some marvelous things that are happening. And one of the marvelous things that's happening is going to be happening this weekend in Southwest Ranches, Florida. Now, where is that? It's right outside of Fort Lauderdale. Not hard to get to. You can fly into Fort Lauderdale. You can drive into Fort Lauderdale. If you live on the east coast of Florida, it's just a little wee drive, either up or down I-95 or up or down that turnpike. You're going to end up in Southwest Ranches at St. Mark the Evangelist Catholic Church for a day that I know is going to change your life. It will. If you go with a heart open and ready to receive, I can promise you that you will absolutely experience the abundant love that God has for you and the abundant graces that he desires to bestow upon you. What's taking place there Saturday, February the 27th is this. It is a year of mercy, women of grace, one day conference, a year of mercy, women of grace, one day conference. Now, some unique features about this conference. First of all, it's taking place in this extraordinary year of Jubilee. And as we've been sharing right here on Women of Grace Live, there are unprecedented graces to receive in this Jubilee year. And it's an extraordinary year outside of the normal cycle. This means that God has unprecedented graces that he definitely wants you to receive. He wants to enliven you, embolden you. He wants you to experience his mercy. He wants for you to enter in deeply to that ocean of mercy that is contained within the the sacred heart of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and to experience that and to share it with others. We're going to be doing all of that in Southwest Ranches at St. Mark the Evangelist Catholic Church on February 27th for this special one-day Women of Grace conference in this year of mercy. Another unique feature, we're inviting gentlemen to join us. Yes, we don't do that all the time. We always have gents that show up, and we're always glad for our guys to come. But I am issuing an invitation to all of you gentlemen to join us for this day because of the theme And that's another unique feature for this upcoming event. The theme is Infinite Mercy Preparation for the Spiritual Battle, based upon a beautiful passage from Isaiah 53, 5. By his stripes we are healed. 
I'm going to be presenting. Father Philip Scott is going to be presenting. Thomas K. Sullivan is going to be presenting. We're going to be talking about the mercy of God, the spiritual battle at hand in this our day and time, how it is that his mercy cloaks us with the power to meet the challenges that face us, and how it is that we experience that victory through Christ Jesus. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful day. In the midst of it all, we're going to have the opportunity to experiencing the healing grace of God and an opportunity for us to participate in a moment that I know will linger in our spiritual lives, possibly for all eternity. Because you know why? When we receive the mercy of God, when we receive his divine grace, do you know what happens? It never ends. It's a portion of the divine life. It's infinite. So we'll experience the infinitude of grace that he has in mind for us, slowly unpacking it, my guess is, through all of the days of our life. I know that's a big thing to say, but it's, that's the way it is with the life of grace, and that's the way that it's supposed to be. Well, I'm happy you're with us right here on Women of Grace Live today. If you want more information about this beautiful event coming up, I want to send you to our website, womenofgrace.com. That's womenofgrace.com. All you need to do there is to look on the home page, upper right-hand corner. You're going to see a special spot right there talking about this beautiful, beautiful event. Click on it. It's a hyperlink. It'll take you to a landing page that gives you even more information and an opportunity to register right online there. We're looking for you to be with us at St. Mark the Evangelist Catholic Church in Southwest Ranches, Florida, February 27th. The times, everything that you need to know is right there on the website. Please come. If you're on the west coast of Florida, please come. If you're on the east coast of Florida, please come. If you're up in Georgia, please come. If you have to get your plane and fly across the country, please come. We're looking forward to being with you. We're going to be there. Yes, we are indeed. Well, and let me tell you what. We're going to be here for you when we come back from our break. And I am going to introduce you to Nikki. And she is going to share her story. Her story of how it is that she discovered Jesus Christ. Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and how it is that she entered into a profound relationship with him that eventually led her from Islam to the Catholic Church. We're going to be right back. Stay with us. Imagine waking up, grabbing your morning coffee, and being told that an army was surrounding your house. That happened to Elisha the prophet, minus the coffee. A king had sent an army to surround his town and capture him, but he never lost his confidence. When his servant panicked, Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. His servant looked up and saw the hills around Elisha filled with horses and chariots of fire. Did you know that every Catholic is anointed as a prophet at baptism? And being a prophet means that sometimes people are going to attack you for sharing the truth, even if you do it lovingly. When that happens to you, remember there's an army of angels and saints cheering you on, Christians around the world walking with you, and above all, the God of the universe is on your side. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is Chris Stefanik from RealLifeCatholic.com on EWTN Radio. Hello, friends. I'm Johnette Benkovic, and I have great news for you today. Did you know that becoming a Women of Grace member is simple, affordable, and valuable? For only $8.95 per month, you are entitled to all Women of Grace and Abundant Life television episodes, plus all of our radio podcasts, all of our archived webinars, and all of our conference and retreat audio and video presentations. In addition, you'll get a 20% discount on all of our store products and so much more. Plus, by becoming a member of our Women of Grace subscribership program, you help us to support our missionary apostolate. Become part of our Women of Grace family by visiting our website today at www.womenofgrace.com. Subscribe to all of our apostolic tools for such a time as this right there at www.womenofgrace.com. Coming up later today on Cresta in the Afternoon. Our topics during Cresta in the Afternoon toggle between church teaching and then using that teaching to shine a light on our world. We'll look at Christ and culture, church and world, religion and public life, from abortion to Zechariah and everything in between. Biblical criticism, Hollywood productions, academic debate, family and love, prayer and spirituality. Cresta in the Afternoon, later today on EWTN Radio. 
Hi, this is Barbara McWiggin. This is Bishop Joseph Bambera of the Diocese of Scranton. I'm Brian Patrick from Morning Glory and EWTN News Nightly. A blessed Lent from all of us at EWTN Radio. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Janet Benkovic. Very happy to be with you today and very happy to have a very special guest with us today. We're not going to be taking any phone calls today because we really want for you to have the opportunity to hear her story. My guess is it will have a profound effect upon you. And if you open your hearts to receive it, I know God has a special grace in mind for you to receive as you listen to the wonderful way in which our Lord through our Blessed Lady, worked in the heart of this lovely woman and brought her from Mohammed to Jesus. Nikki, welcome to Women of Grace Live. I'm so delighted to have you with us today. I'm so happy to be with you, Jeanette, and share my story. Well, thank you so much for giving your fiat to my invitation. Your story is one that is truly amazing, Nikki, and it's one that I know uh, is going to touch the hearts of our listeners, just as I was sharing with them. And I'm quite certain that you never dreamed when you were a little girl in Pakistan that one day you would come into the Catholic Church. Why don't you begin at the beginning? Tell us a little bit about your upbringing in Pakistan. Tell us a little bit about the way in which you were formed and shaped in the Islamic tradition. I grew up in Africa, and I was born in a Shia family, which was actually very liberal. So, we, you know, my sisters and I, we didn't grow up covering our head or anything like that, and we actually had a very um, liberal upbringing. And uh, whenever we would return to Pakistan every year on vacation is when we would visit the mosque and, um, you know, pray as a community. But growing up, uh, we just knew that we were Muslim. We knew that we loved God. We knew Allah was the way and the only way. And um, we had a really happy childhood growing up that way. And um, it was when I was 16 that my uh, parents arranged my marriage in a Sunni family, and that's when I really got to know what Islam was all about. When I was 16, my parents decided that that was uh, the right thing for me is to get engaged, and I was raised in a way where I believed that whatever was decided, I had to be obedient. And I grew up with a really romantic outlook on life. Um, In Africa, we didn't really have TV or any technology as such, so not much influence from the outside world other than books. And I was an avid reader. I would read a lot of romance novels and mysteries, and I believed that I would meet my knight in shining armor. So when my engagement was arranged, I, I had all these images and, you know, ideas of how romantic this was going to be. And at 18 um, is when I was married, and I was married in Pakistan, and my parents came, we got married, and they left. And my husband was 10 years older than me uh, from, the, from the Sunni background, as I mentioned, And that's when I really got to see Islam up close. I lived in Pakistan and uh, with my in-laws, as the tradition is. And that was a really hard time, Jeanette, in my life. It was traumatic. Um, I was 18, and within a couple days, my dreams were all crushed about all the romance novels that were in my head. My life was definitely nothing like that. And... um, My husband treated me more like a child, um, you know, which I was, but um, he didn't give me the respect and dignity as a woman, as a person, and uh, nobody really cared what I felt or what my desires were or what my feelings were. It was just being a good daughter-in-law and a good wife. May I ask you a question here, Nikki, and this has to do with the uh, tradition of arranged marriages. When uh, uh, parents would be potentially looking for uh, a husband for their daughter, how would they go about that process of determining who would be a suitable individual for her? Well, usually it is uh, where they look at the family 
in the, the background, and they think that it would be uh, the right match. And the reason my parents picked uh, this particular man was because he had also grown up in Africa um, and uh, studied uh, in the United States. So they thought that he would have a more open mind than somebody who had lived in Pakistan all his life. Mm-hmm. So they thought it was a good match based on the background. But the part that they missed or in their um, innocence didn't understand that just because they didn't really see the Shia Sunni difference, they just believed in loving God and being a good Muslim, uh, they didn't realize that on the other side, that's not how it was looked at. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that difference between the Shiites and the Sunni in relationship to uh, their practice of Islam and their view of Muhammad. In the, the difference really came when uh, the Prophet Muhammad, when he died, um, the Shi- the, that was where the split came. The Shias believed that Prophet Muhammad chose Ali, his cousin, to be the continuation of the leadership. And the Sunnis believed that he didn't pick anybody, and eventually they picked a leader, the Caliph. So when you hear of the Caliphate, that's yes. where it comes from. That's the leader who is a religious leader and a political leader. And in Islam, the two are very much together because politics is also dictated by the faith. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, the, uh, the Sunnis have a, a, a more conservative, uh, more uh, restricted kind of view. Uh, this would be the branch that observes the, the times of prayer and the fasting. Uh, this would be the the uh, branch of Islam where the women would be um, clothed in such a way that much of their appearance is hidden. Am I correct? Yes. Um, yes, even the Shias do practice the prayers and the fasting in the Quran, but the big difference comes in where the Sunnis just follow the teachings and the life of Muhammad and don't see anything beyond that. Whereas in the Shia religion, we had um, the imams, which were the continuation of Muhammad. So the sect that I um, was born into is a sect that still has an imam today um, that is the leader. So that Shia sect looks at that imam as the one who translates the Quran for them, tells them how to apply it in today's world and today's Mm -hmm. life. So it's a little more... um, uh, relevant, I could, you know, you could say to the way we live our life, mm-hmm. but the Sunni religion stays only with the teachings of Muhammad. That is the key for them and the Quran. I see. So this was a real cultural shock for you to move from this one branch of Islam to another and to begin to live in a household that viewed the whole religion very differently. Yes, it was a shock, but. Because I was so unhappy and it was such a traumatic time for me, I think I spent the three years that I lived after my marriage in Pakistan in a state of shock. It was like living in a prison where everything changed for me. I couldn't drive. I had no freedom. I could only go and come as my husband or my father-in-law would take me. And my whole world changed. So going through all that, I turned very desperately to the Sunni religion. I started to learn the the prayer, you know, being um, punctual in the prayers, how to go through the washing ritual, how to cover my head right, where no hair would show, my elbows would be covered, down to, you know, the position of the toes, the fingers, and all the details. There's so many rules that Muslims have to follow um, to be a good Muslim. And I learned all that and embraced it because my life was so unhappy and so dark that I needed to hold on to something. So I actually became a devout Sunni. Hmm. And when you were still a young girl, 19 years old, you gave birth to your first child. Yes. I had my daughter in the first year of my marriage. And um, again, that was, um, you know, in a very difficult time. And that's where I started to really pray even more because I was um, concerned what the life of this baby was going to be, especially a girl. 
And I turned, um, I don't know if you're aware, but in the Quran there is a chapter that is devoted to Mary um, called Maryam, Surah and Maryam, which is a chapter on uh, the mother of the prophet Jesus. And I had a deep, a deep love for Maryam, so I would pray that chapter every day, and I would um, ask Allah to make my child as holy and um, like uh, Maryam, and I wanted to be holy like her. So that was my devotion. Every day I would read that chapter, um, Surah Maryam. And by then I was praying five times a day, reading the Quran, doing anything and everything I could because I thought if I followed all the rules, maybe Allah would notice me prostrate on the prayer mat and take pity on me and take me out of this darkness. Because my parents were not open to divorce, or that was a life sentence. Marriage is forever, and divorce is really unheard of. So I knew this was it. You know, somehow I had to survive this and protect my child. Mm. You know, as you're sharing with us, you know, Nikki, I, I can only begin to imagine the weight that was on you. I mean, you're a young girl. Your parents are gone now. They're they're on a different continent. You're in a home where there's little respect being shown. Uh, you you basically are, in a sense, held captive because there's a lack of liberty that's being uh, afforded you. Um, you're treated not kindly by your husband. He treats you as a child. He doesn't regard you as a woman. And yet you are his wife, and you are fulfilling your marital duties to him as a wife. You have a child. There seems to be nothing to do. You turn to the one thing that you think can can give you the kind of... um, interior resolve that you need uh, to be able to withstand what seems to be your future, which looks bleak and in which you don't see any hope for change or for um, happiness or joy to enter in. And you find this chapter in the Quran about uh, a woman whose name is Mariam, and she is the mother of the prophet Jesus, according to the Quran, and you begin to uh, open your heart to her in a way. Can you share with us a little bit about how um, Mary is characterized in the Quran? What was it that you read there that kind of captivated your attention and and held you there desiring for uh, her influence in some way? The, The thing about Islam is that you have to read the Quran in Arabic for it to have the, you know, for it to be really done correctly. And I didn't speak Arabic or understand Arabic, so I would have, I had the transliteration, so I would read the Arabic words, but I really didn't know what it meant. Mm-hmm. What I did know about Maryam was that she was the holiest woman, regarded very highly that the birth of Prophet Jesus was, um, was she was a virgin when she gave birth to him. So that part was there, and, she, and her holiness. And that's about all I knew uh, about her. But, and I would be reading it in Arabic, but it was the loss that I just felt for her, and it wasn't because of what I read about her. It's just my heart would just love her. Hmm. So it was more a heart relationship than because than for what I had read about her. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if even in those very very early days there was a um, I'm going to use this word there there, there was a, a a revelation of sorts to you about this beautiful maternal beatitude of Our Lady. There was almost like a a call, you know, something very sweet coming from the Spirit of the Living God that was at work. In you, however, nothing really changed within this relationship with your husband or with his family, did it? No, um, things only continued to get worse. And um, and I asked him to look for a job outside uh, Pakistan. 
And he was a little bit tired also of um, working in Pakistan, so he had spent most of his life outside, so he agreed, and he started to look for work outside Pakistan, and he did get a job in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And it was a real struggle for his parents to uh, let us go, and they first wanted him to go and for me to stay back to take care of them. But thankfully, um, I was able to leave as well, and um, I joined him in the Middle East, and that's where we spent the next 10 years. Um, And that gave me a little bit more freedom because I wasn't living with my in-laws. But underneath it all, it's it's a male-dominated society. So you may I was able to wear jeans or dress the way I was used to growing up, but underneath it all, I needed his approval and uh, bef- before I could do anything. But it was a step away from um, this, uh, the the lifestyle in Pakistan where I had no freedom, and it was in the Middle East where my son was born. In those 10 years, I had uh, my son there. And things actually started to deteriorate, and um, near the end of those 10 years, it got so bad that I had become suicidal, um, that, you know, close to a nervous breakdown. Things were just terrible. And I started to really get concerned about my children, that if one day we had to leave the Middle East, we would have to go back to Pakistan, and I just, I would have rather died than go, gone back there. So my parents finally um, saw that things truly weren't going to change, and my father sent me money to buy a ticket to leave. And I always knew in my heart that I had to come to America because America represented freedom, and I believed as a woman I would get dignity and I would have rights, something I had never had my whole life. And I just knew if only I could get to America, I would get that. And thankfully, I had relatives who lived here, and um, they welcomed me, and my father sent me the money, and I was able to escape with my two children uh, from the Middle East and um, come to America. And it was, I'll never forget the day when we landed in New York, that I, that's the first breath that I took of relief. After so many years, I felt I had escaped out of that darkness. You know, you're using, that's the second time, Nikki, you've used the word escape. And, you know, there's numbers of different ways to look at that word. And and we can talk about escaping from the interior struggle. But we can also talk about the escape as if escaping from captivity. And so, you know, in, in the... In the latter sense of that word, you know, your parents send you the money, but you can't just leave and get on a plane and haul off. It really was a type of escape, wasn't it? Yes, it was, because um, my husband had hidden my passport. I um, mean, he, he tried everything to make it impossible. And, you know, all he had to do was make a phone call to the airport and say that I was leaving without his permission with the children and they would have stopped me right there. And that's why I say it was until I landed in New York, I wasn't sure if I was truly, uh, if I had truly, again, escaped. Mm -hmm. I I personally cannot imagine the stress that you were under in that moment. I cannot imagine the anxiety and the terror that that must have built up in you. I mean, that had to be absolutely, you, you, you had to feel as though you were running for your life uh, to be able to cope f- with that kind of fear. Yeah, that is a- actually exactly how it felt. And I don't. I think I was just completely in a state of um, shock. And I don't know if I really was able to see what was happening around me. I was just holding on to my two children, and my son was six years old at that time. And um, and they. It was a real hard time for them also because for them to witness. You know, their father trying to stop us and me running and, you know, getting in a cab and leaving. It was, it was a really traumatic time. 
I'm quite certain of it. Well, you hear that music. That means that we're going to go to a break, friends. And when we come back, more with our guest today, Nikki. She's telling us about the story, her journey from Mohammed to Jesus, from darkness to light. Fascinating. And when we come back, Nikki, we're going to pick up there. We're going to talk a little bit about what it was like landing there in New York City and how that began a whole new beautiful experience of life for you. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I am Johnette Bankovic. We're happy to be with you today. We're not taking phone calls. We're listening to this fascinating testimony of God's love. We're going to be right back. Stay with us. From the archives, this this is the wisdom of Mother Angelica. Let me tell you about the difference between a conversion and a simple change of life. Now you can change your life by changing your job. Now conversion is a change, but it's a radical change. For some people who have strong wills, they can change. The, the Spirit of the Lord comes along and says, I love you, and they never heard that before. Today, we have an idea in this new society, the new, the new religion, the new theology, whatever you want to call it, that we never sin. Well, if you never sin, you don't need conversion, do you? What will you convert from? But T.D., that's one of those lies that we buy, and it's not true. We do need conversion. For more about Mother Angelica, visit EWTNRC.com. The Christian life on earth is a warfare. As baptized Christians, we are called to be soldiers of Christ, warriors in the kingdom, family of God. I'm Thomas K. Sullivan, author of the book, Call to Knighthood, and designer of the Warrior's Rosary. St. Padre Pio said, The rosary is the weapon for these times. Manufactured by premier Italian rosary maker Gorelli in Italy, this one-of-a-kind designed Warrior's Rosary brings together the elements of military combat and spiritual warfare. Each piece is custom designed to embody the reality of a spiritual warrior in the kingdom of God that every baptized Christian is called to be. This rosary features a warrior saint from different parts of the world on each of its Our Father medals. Let us ask in faith for the strength, the grace, the wisdom to engage in this warfare with the rosary. Get yours today at EWTNRC.com. Thank you for listening to EWTN Radio. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Janet Benkovic. So happy to be with you today. It's one of those special days. We are not taking phone calls today because we have the opportunity to interview our guest, Nikki, and she is sharing a powerful testimony with us today about how it was that our Lord led her from Mohammed to his son, Jesus, and how it is that she left darkness and entered into light. Prior to our break, we were sharing uh, with you uh, that portion of her story where she makes her escape from the Middle East, taking her two children with her and arrives in New York City. And in Nikki's words, it was just only then that she breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that she was going to be safe and that she was going to find that freedom that she was looking for. And yeah, I can, you know, as, as heightened as that experience of fear and anxiety must have been as you fled the Middle East, Nikki, I would imagine the feeling of relief was equally great, only so much more satisfying for you. Oh, absolutely. And I was, that's when I first was able to sleep that night to really sleep in peace and know, and I knew there was a, there was a lot to be done, um, a hard road ahead of me. But that didn't bother me as long as I was free and I could make my choices because until then, I felt that I had never, and I was 30 years old when I, when I came to America, and I had never had a choice in anything in my life. Maybe the only choice I had is which book to read, but that's about it. Everything else was decided for me. And it was the first, that night when I slept in uh, the United States, I felt that now I was going to get my life back. 
Yeah. Well, you know, Nikki, this is an interesting thing because here you were, you were married for, at this point in time, you had been married for 12 to 13 years and you had been living in a situation where the freedom that you had basically enjoyed as a child, uh, being raised in Africa, attending American schools there, experiencing, you know, a more liberal approach to, to your religion, uh, had been taken away from you. And so, now you you come to a whole new country and fortunately you have relatives here but still you, you know there's there's you had been i guess the word that i would want to say is that you had been enculturated into a kind of of restrictive environment was it somewhat frightening to think about you know the allocation of this freedom you know how how would you make decisions you know what decisions would you make um, did you have the the interior strength to have confidence in the decisions that you would make or you know was there some kind of apprehension that was attending to all of this you're you're exactly right Jeanette I did it was great to have the freedom, but then to look at it, it seemed like this whole world had opened up before me, and now I could choose, and that was that became scary too. And um, I had never worked. I didn't know how to drive. I had never paid bills. I didn't. I didn't know how to where to even begin. Yeah. And thankfully, because I had relatives, I lived with them for three months, and that was a great help. And my uncle um, taught me how to drive, and um, we went and got my first car, and um, that was um, an incredible moment. You know, I got my at 30, and um, just the freedom that now I could get in the car and I could go somewhere. Yes. And luckily, the town that they lived in uh, was a smaller town, so the roads were easy to navigate. And um, I, I found a job. My hun- uncle helped me. I got a job, and that job um, allowed me the freedom to drop my kids to school and pick them up. And eventually I moved out, and that was a big step because now I was going to live on my own with my children mm-hmm. and, um, you know, paying the bills. I had everything laid out. I didn't want to be late for any payments. Just going through those steps, it was so foreign and scary, but at the same time so liberating that I was writing the check. And um, I wouldn't go out in the evening. When it got dark, I didn't leave the house because I was too scared. And and, and how are your children handling all of this? Um, The children were um, not, they, they handled it much better than I was because I guess they were younger, they started school, and they adapted um, much more easily than I did. Mm -hmm. The whole process of um, being separated from their father and the whole move losing their friends there, all that was um, hard. I think it was just the pain that was was difficult, and it was hard for me as a mother to watch that pain and then to go through the feeling of guilt that Maybe if I could have just taken the suffering, then maybe my kids could still have their father. But then I would look at the bigger picture and know that in the long run, they would have no life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me ask you, too, what was going on with your husband at this point? You're here now, but are you divorced from him at this point in time? No. um, He followed me within a month. He he came here and um, and it turned pretty ugly. He tried uh, by crying and begging me to come back, and when that wasn't going to work, it just he threatened to kidnap my kids. And um, we went through two years of a very difficult and an ugly divorce. And um, my parents eventually accepted it. At first, they thought a separation would help, but they finally accepted that it it just wasn't going to be, you know. So it took two years to finally get the divorce, and um, he moved back. So I was here with my two children. In the meantime, things are still happening with you spiritually. Share with us a little bit about what was going on. So through through that whole time, I, I had become very devout Muslim. So I was praying more and more and just begging Allah to have mercy and to take care of me and my children. So my prayer life had gotten deeper and deeper. 
actually I had I was the most um, um, Muslim in my family by at this time because I thought if I followed all the rules perfectly then God would have mercy on me and my children so I was a a very devout Muslim at this point mm-hmm. And somewhere along the way here, you things progress. You're 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 culturating here to the United States of America. This way of life is becoming more and more familiar with you. You're working now, and you meet an individual. You meet yes, a gentleman. I meet um, I meet this man, and he um, he started to ask me what I liked and what I thought, and he made me laugh, and I met him at work, and and I was just amazed that there was a man who cared to ask what I thought or liked or felt, and and no man had made me laugh. All I had had were tears. So I was just, um, just amazed at this, and um, this man eventually um, became a really good friend of mine, and um, soon, you know, we our friendship developed, and uh, we did get married. And he was a Christian. Yes, he he was a Christian, but he wasn't a really a practicing. He was actually Catholic, and uh, but to me, he was just Christian, and um, and I knew he was a good man, and uh, kind and gentle and loving to my children, and. Um, when we decided to get married, I made it very clear that the marriage had to happen in a mosque because I wasn't going to offend Allah. And um, and at that point, you know, he, he was okay with it, you know, and um, and he understood that for my children I wanted to make sure that I had a Muslim home so they would, uh, you know, have some um, continuity of their life. So we did get married in a mosque. And um, at home, you know, I would pray five times a day, and um, I got a Quran teacher for my children, and um, they were reading the Quran. They didn't enjoy it, and they uh, would scream and yell every time. But, you know, I insisted that they had to know Allah, and I was scared that they would lose their faith in this culture. I wanted them to have all the freedoms, but I didn't want them to lose Islam because I believed that Islam was the only way, the true way, and everybody else was lost. And I didn't want my children to be lost. You know, Nikki, you you had, when you were in this most difficult situation uh, in the Middle East and, and in Pakistan before that, you had this uh, calling, this, this affection that you were feeling for Mariam from the Quran. Did that leave you at this time, or was that growing? And how did it begin to change within you? At this, at this time, I... Um I was really focused on Allah. What happened was that now that my life was kind of settled and normal, you know, I had a husband who loved me, my children were okay, I lived in a country where I was free, so I felt, okay, now that my life is normal, I can now focus on Allah even more. Because since I was young, I always desired to be close to Allah. I knew that there was a truth that existed, and I wanted to get to that truth. So I got more and more. I would fast more. I'd pray more. I was doing everything I could, and I was searching for Allah. So I started to spend more time in prayer, and uh, Mariam was always, um, al- always there. And I would say now she was more in the background but mm-hmm. always present. My love for her was always there, but I was searching for Allah. I wanted to get close to Him. But every time that I would pray and be prostrate on that prayer mat, I felt there was a wall. There was a darkness and a wall, and I knew that Allah was on the other side, but somehow I couldn't get to Him. There was a separation. And that's what I wanted to get through. It was this quest, this desire in my heart that I wanted to know him. You know, it's a beautiful thing that you're sharing here because you're talking about you wanted to know the truth. And in the midst of this, you know, no matter how much you're praying to Allah, no matter how faithful you are, no matter how strict of a lifestyle you're adopting for yourself, 
You just can't get to the truth. You just can't get there. And that was going to change for you. How did that change begin to take shape and form? Well, Allah answered me, but it was in a very different way than I had ever imagined. We were at St. Patrick's Cathedral, and we were, you know, it was more like a tourist stop, and I had never been there, and my husband insisted, you know, you have to go see this cathedral. So we were there with our kids. And as soon as I walked in, I first asked Allah to forgive me because I was walking into a place where there were idols, and, you know, I wanted Allah to understand I wasn't, you know, I was doing this for my husband. And I stepped in, and not much further in, there was a stained glass picture of Jesus that was hanging there, and it seemed that his eyes just pierced me, and it made me very uncomfortable. And I tried to look away, but it, there were like a magnet kept drawing me back. And everywhere I walked, I felt those eyes were watching me. And I found the cathedral to be beautiful, but as I walked through it, I kept praying to Allah to forgive me that I was in this place, which I know, he, you know, this is blasphemy. They believe in the Son of God, and, you know, I'm sorry, and all this is going through my head. And I was about to walk out where I felt Maryam whisper to me to come back. And I have to say, at that time, it wasn't Maryam, the word Maryam that came to my head, but it was Mary. Hmm. I felt Mary call me. And I tried to ignore it because I thought this is just my imagination, but it was a persistent call. And then I had to answer her because I loved her. So I told my family, I'll be back, and I knew exactly where I was being called. I was being called to the little chapel of Mary in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And I went there, and I stood before the statue, and I didn't know what to do because I wasn't going to kneel. That's a sin. I wasn't going to kneel at a statue. So I just stood there, and I said, I'm here. I know you called me, and I love you, but I don't know what you want from me, and I'm not going to worship you. So I spent a little bit of time there, and I did notice how devout the people who were there with the reverence and the love that they had for her, which really touched my heart. But I couldn't make myself kneel because I was faithful to Allah. So, you know, I spent a little bit of time and I left. But for the next few days, I went back every single day because I felt I had to go see her. Something is beginning to happen and something is beginning to take shape and form within you. And there is this beautiful recognition that it's tied up with this woman whose name is Mary. How did this grow and develop and how did she begin to lead you to the one who is exactly what it was that you had been searching and praying for, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life? Well, shortly after that, um, I had a dream and it was like the beginning of December. I don't remember the exact date it was. But I'd had a dream in which I was kind of coming out of my sleep, so I wasn't completely asleep. And I saw Jesus and Mary, and they were both at my bedside. And they, they were close to me, and th there was an exchange within my soul. It's like they were speaking to my soul. And there weren't any physical words being said, but they were speaking in a, in a way where they were talking to my soul and teaching it and sharing things with it. And my soul was then responding. Everything that it had ever held within was being shared with them. And as mm. this exchange was going on, I felt like a light was entering into my soul, like I was being infused with light. And it was just incredible. And when I woke up, it wasn't a dream. I felt I had experienced it, so it was a turning point for me. And I knew something had changed in me after that. And that morning, I just felt like my soul was different, that there was a light within me. I was no longer the same person. But in my head, I couldn't make any sense of it, because why Jesus? You know, Mary, I understood, but why this Jesus? And he came with a crown of thorns on his head. But I didn't understand. I knew he was a prophet, so then I started to think, well, you know, he's a prophet. Maybe it's just that I love Mary, that, you know, I see the prophet Jesus. But my heart kept saying there's more to this, and something had changed. And after that, I started to have more dreams, and it started to feel like 
The air around me was charged. Everything had changed. I was living like in a bubble, and everywhere I turned, I, I would notice the cross. I would notice a Bible. I would see anywhere I went, it was all about this Jesus. And I started to talk to my husband about it, who until then had never really spoken about Christianity. And my understanding of Christianity was very basic. I didn't really know what was Protestant, Catholic. I just thought Christians were Christians, you know. I was so uninterested in knowing more that I'd never really read anything about it. And when I told my husband, that was the first time that he was he felt he had the freedom to share with me about Christianity. And he told me that Jesus was the Son of God and he came to save the world, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world. And when he started to say this, I covered my ears and said, you can't talk like this in my house. This is blasphemy. I can't even, this is so sinful, I can't even listen to these things. And I would walk away angry, but then the next day I would tell him, tell me more about this Jesus. And <laughs> as soon as he would tell me, I would again say, stop, you can't talk like this. But I wanted to know about this Jesus, but there was this internal struggle, because Islam is based on fear. There's a lot of fear. You're not allowed to really contemplate anything. You can contemplate as long as it's within the parameters of Islam, but you have to stay in that box. So I was scared. You know, in my head was all these fears and all the list of things that could God, that Allah would do to me because I was, you know, encouraging this conversation. But I couldn't help it because during the day, the whole time, all these things were just jumping out at me. You know, I was starting to see visions and everything was about Christianity. And I started to get angry. I was angry at Allah that I had searched for him. I had asked him to come to allow me to come closer to him. And now he had put this Jesus before me. Why was he doing this to me? Why this confusion? Why was he not sending Muhammad in a dream? You know, why was he torturing me? But I couldn't ignore it either. I couldn't say, you know, well, I'll just forget about it. it. I knew there was something going on. We have about three minutes left in our time together today, and you've gotten us to, uh, you know, I think the, 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 the heightened moment of, of this beautiful story of conversion and this beautiful story of being led by God. What was it that finally tipped you over? I mean, here you are. You're, you, we can hear it even in your voice now how difficult this was was for you and yet this hound of heaven our God was he was coming he was coming he was coming he knew the motivation of your heart and he saw your desire and he wanted you to have the fullness of truth how was it that he finally brought you into the church that is unfounded it was actually a friend who I had been confiding it in and she kept inviting me to her church and after um, a long time I agreed to go to her church with her And she happened to be Catholic. And I walked into that church, and I took a breath, and I said, He's here. The one who's calling me is here. And I started going to that church and just sitting and and looking at that cross and arguing with it and saying, You can't be the Son of God. You aren't. It's impossible. God has no son. And as I would argue for days and months, and eventually one day, This Jesus, who I was arguing with, had enough of it, and he spoke from the crucifix, and he said to me, Clear, who are you to tell me who I can be and cannot be? If you really want to know the truth, go and come back to me like a child. And I ran out of the church, scared, petrified, couldn't understand, I couldn't believe what I had heard, but I did return and I knew he wanted me to come empty, and I did want to know the truth. I had searched for 40 years. And that day when I came back like a child, and I sat down and I said, okay, you tell me, what is the truth? And in that moment, Jonah, a light from the cross, that crucifix, came and pierced my heart. And the truth was just revealed to me. And I fell to my knees, shaking and sobbing, and saying, I believe. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, I believe. And in that moment, I knew I had found God. I knew I had found the God I was searching for because it is only through Jesus you come to the Father. 
And it's when I accepted Jesus that I met God the Father that transformed and changed my life and saved me and took me out of the darkness into the light. Nikki, I am sitting here and I have goosebumps up my arms <laughs> and down my legs because what a beautiful, beautiful moment you have shared. And I think that there is a lesson, my dear friends, in this woman's testimony for each one of us. When we come to our Lord as a child and give ourselves to Him, He does everything for us. And He answers and meets our deepest need. Nikki, I want to thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Your testimony is riveting. You are a beautiful daughter of the Most High God. Our Lord and Our Lady love you so much. And we're going to have to leave it there. Until we're together again, friends, God bless you. Bye-bye now.